we have time tonight <laughs> to see what the Spirit's going to say. Um, let's start in chapter 3. And as you turn there, um, I'm just going to recap a little bit of the journey that brought us to chapter 3. And um, what I like to do is walk through the scriptures because the word of God is perfect. <laughs> this is just, it's the word of God. And um, my heart is always to come just as a seeker and as a learner, not as a teacher, and to come under the authority of the word. So we're just looking into God's word and trusting the Holy Spirit to minister Christ to us so he can be your teacher. How does that sound? He'll be our teacher. And the word of God will be our, our source. And we'll just be together seeking him. And uh, that's the spirit of this gathering in Lacan. So, um, you know, it, it, as we continue through the journey of childbirth, if we could say, or bringing forth the son, um, and it gets into the times of God trying to deal with us so we can bring forth the son you know it's a different um it's a different kind of journey we all know this than learning about it if there's a season for understanding that christ is in you christ in you the hope of glory you know we sharing the message with someone for the first time is incredible the first time you hear it but then there comes a season where god wants to bring forth christ in you <laughs> he wants it to be a son, not the message of about a son, and he wants you to be the vessel that births him, and a, a real birth. And um, now that's a whole different journey, and that's a whole different experience, a whole different story. It's our story, and that gets messy, and it gets, um, you know, when he starts going deep, and as we've seen in Micah, dealing with stuff that is pressing up the sun out, you know, taking his place, usurping the air, crowding out the sea, right? That gets, um, when the Holy Spirit comes to do that work for the sun to come out of us, that, it's, it's, it can be heartbreaking, it can be, there's travail involved, there's groanings that cannot be uttered, and, um, there's birth pangs, all these things. And if that's not happening, Maybe it's not the season for you to bring forth a son. But if it's not happening and you feel it is the season for you to bring forth a son, then it's time to cry out. And we're going to look at that in chapter 4. But, you know, once they're delivered to Babylon, which we're going to look at the progression here in chapter 3, they're not just put there. And we're going to see how and why they got put there. It's going to be pretty deep tonight. Not deep. <laughs> deep right here. And... um. They're not put into Babylon to just um, go through 70 years. They are put there to travail in birth. It is a travail. And if it's not, they're going to, and here's just a spoiler, they're going to be worshiping the beast. It's Babylon. There's no passive there. You're either of one or another. Because there's so much stuff in us when it's not Christ formed in us, when it's us and not him, that um, is just vile, and it has to be dealt with. And if it's not dealt with, what does it do if it's left alone in a field? It grows. And if it keeps growing, what happens? You mature. It matures until eventually it, it brings forth fruit. So, you know, these things left undealt with will bring forth after their own kind. Every seed will bring forth after its kind. And, um, you know, it, it's amazing when we hear the, the dying seed principle of a seed brings forth that in Genesis. You know, the first little Genesis. But by the time you get past the Genesis of the thing to the birthing of a man-child, that'd be the book of Revelation. It's no longer just a really great awakening to God has principles of seeds and seeds going out of ground and bring forth after their kind. It's travailing in birth.
truth in the midst of beasts and wolves and extremity and you know, all of that ordered of God to bring forth the firstborn in sacrifice. <laughs> so from Genesis to Revelation is our lives. That's our life. We're begotten in Genesis of incorruptible seed. But by the book of Revelation, we're supposed to be bringing forth a man-child, and it's the firstborn son in sacrifice. And um, those 66 books aren't just teaching manuals. They're the walk of faith for us as the Mary, the vessel. <laughs> and when they just become a church service or a teaching or something that doesn't ignite us to travail, I mean, not ignite us or inspire us to be anointed and inspired, you know, but to travail for him to increase and us to decrease in real major ways. Then something's wrong. And I'm saying that to me, something's wrong. And, um, you know, that's not the model of a school or a church or a denomination or an individual. It's, I believe that's the focus of the Father and the spirit and the life of his son and in us, and that the Bible's dedicated to bringing forth many sons in the image of the firstborn. <laughs> I just do. And um, so this is, you know, introduction to what we're looking at, kind of fixing to look at. My Bible's falling apart in Micah, literally. So, but I wrote this down just today when I was meditating. And um, this is a sentence came to me. It said, part of bringing forth the son is weeping over the beasts that are within me that keep trying to devour the seed of the lamb. The winds blow and the beasts rise. It's in Daniel. You know, there is a time for mourning. There is a time for humbling at the view of what I have done or we have done and been in a spirit that usurps the lamb that's inside of us. There's a time to mourn over the firstborn son that we pierced. Zechariah, Amos, different places. These prophets cried out. There is a time to be undone. And not undone because you're a beast. You know, you, you can get undone because, oh, wretched man that I am. And I'm just wretched and I'm undone because I'm wretched. And I repent. But I, I believe, and that's what I'm saying, I'm just a seeker here. I'm not a teacher. But I believe that the greatest undoing is, is when I see what my beast has done to the lamb in the womb of my spirit. What the beast that is me has done to the son that is in me. That I have pierced him and I have usurped him and pressed past him with my attitudes and thoughts and my actions and my words. And, um, you know, that... Blessed are they that mourn. There is a blessedness to that mourning because the Father, I believe, views those tears in regards to his Son. You know, they're not just tears about an old creation that is already condemned and corrupt and put away. That those tears don't reach, I don't believe those tears reach the Father's heart. But when we cry over what, how we have treated his Son, the Son he put inside of us, because we are a beast apart from him, um, I believe those tears mean something to the Father. And they, they are, you know, we say there's eternal moments. I think there's eternal tears. And there's just soulish fits. You know, we all know. We all know. And you just feel like you've cried, but there's nothing there. But these are different. These are different. These are different. And the deeper the Lord can pierce us, the greater we can become made aware of how we've pierced him. And the greater we can become awakened to that, the more place he's going to have in us. And um, like Saul, last week's Cross Principles class, like Saul of Tarsus and how he breathed out slaughter like a beast. And he knew with every fiber of his being what he was, how he persecuted even unto chains and imprisonment and death those that were of the way of the Lamb. And Jesus came and said, why do you persecute me? He knew that he was, he had gnashed upon them with his teeth. He had. That he had done that. And that he was that apart from the lamb. <laughs> it's, 
the, but he, he took it in, didn't he? He didn't justify, he didn't minimize, he uh, didn't Mordecai. <laughs> he took it in and he said, Lord, you know, I want to bring forth your son. I want to bring him forth in specific ways that he defines in his epistles. And you can research that and probably have. So, so once we get to Micah 3, the piercing's going a little bit deeper. You know, we felt it pretty deep in two when he said, you lay on your beds and you find ways to steal your neighbor's land. And we took that in more intimate into, you, we want the glory and we are finding ways to be higher and you know, all these things. But it's usurping the firstborn son. It's wanting the portion of the heir. And that's all by nature. Okay, so that was a good pierce. That got us, you know, it did a little bit of, okay, but the sword goes deeper, I believe. In chapter 3, it, it's going to hit pretty deep. And it has to because by chapter 4, you're travailing. You're travailing. And, um, and you won't be. And, and you're travailing in Babylon, which is what we're going to see. In um, and that isn't going to happen um, if chapter 3 doesn't get you. I mean, really, really get you so maybe we need to, to go through chapter three and cry out to the lord and maybe we have a little extra time tonight so we can let the spirit of god move maybe we can pray for one another you know maybe we can let the spirit move i've always loved that and we have time but i'm going to ask y'all tonight can i be as without being rude or arrogant as none of that's in my heart please don't be passive tonight let's wake up shake up get just travail let it's not a class. Let's let's birth this out and let's thresh this out. And um, he's giving us iron hooves to do it. You know, it's in there. We haven't got there yet, but it's there. He's making us a threshing instrument so we can deal with the stuff in us. He's making us that by his spirit. And um, and let's prepare our hearts that maybe at the end of tonight we're going to pray for one another a little bit, and and just pray, just come together and pray for what to bring forth the sun. I mean, yeah, but I don't want to do that if, it, if it's, we're just kind of, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to dishonor the Holy Spirit. It's just not in my heart to do it as a class. It's nothing negative to anyone, but, you know, that's just what I feel in his heart. And um, so thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Let's just set our sails in that direction. Lord, we, we are desperate. We are desperate for you. We are dull, and I am dull, and I am in many ways so very unaware and unmoved of how, how I have done these things to your son in me, how the, the, the beasts in me have pierced the sun in, that was meant to come forth in me. And Lord, it just hadn't hit me. It just hadn't hit me, not in the way that it would hit you about your son. But Father, I want, I want to, to um, I don't want to be focused on myself. I don't want to be introspective, but I want to be made aware of your firstborn son and the place that he should have in me as a vessel of his life. And Lord, I just, I just, um, I just ask that your spirit would, you know, do what we can't do. May the word of God be a threshing instrument tonight a double-edged sword, able to divide soul and spirit, joint, marrow, motive, intent. Lord, these are the things we're talking about, not teaching. These things speak of our inward parts, which we want to have possessed by the sacrifice. We want them to become the inward parts of the lamb in us, Lord. We want that on the inside of us. We don't want to wear sheep's clothes and be wolves inside. We want the lamb in the inward parts. We want it with all of our heart, Lord Jesus. So have your way by your spirit, deep inside, for your sake we pray, amen. All right, let's go to Micah chapter 3 and just kind of follow through these scriptures. Um, so chapter 3 and verse 1, and I said, Here I pray you, O heads of Jacob, and you princes of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment? Now, this is a great contrast to the, the final verse in chapter 2 because remember the ending of our last class was that the good shepherd was the breakthrough. 
because he laid his life down for the sheep. And truly out of John chapter 10, the context of that was that he let the wolves eat him so they wouldn't eat the sheep. And, and he broke through in the selfless giving, broke them out of the pen. But here, that's a leader, that's a head. That is the head of, of Israel, that's Jesus. But here he have, I pray ye, O heads, these are heads of Jacob, princes of the house of Israel, princes of his leaders. Do you not know judgment? In other words, as heads, as leaders, do you not know the spirit of what we are? I mean, <laughs> um, the true head is a slaughtered lamb, not a wolf. But these heads and princes are in stark contrast for the true head that was prevented, presented to us in previous years. Okay, so, you know, these are our governments within us. You know, Jesus is our head, and he is the slaughtered lamb. He's going to break us out of this pen. But we have heads and princes inside of us, don't we? He's the king of kings and the lord of lords. But that's of the kingdom within our own hearts. And these guys, um, they don't know judgment. They don't know the lamb. These things in us, me. <laughs> Verse 2 goes on to speaking to those heads who hate the good and love the evil. So the words hate and love are words of the heart. Um, these are not duties or requirements, you know. It's not like... Um, these are not their responsibilities for their jobs and their offices as princes and heads of the people. This is speaking of the passions and the draws of their inward nature. So they hate the good and they love the evil. There's an immediate emphasis upon the things of the heart. And we find the Lord pointing to the inward nature of the leaders and not the outward office. What is leading inside of us? What is taking government, what is governmentally taking the lead in our heart. You know what I'm saying? And, um, and, and it's funny because he's not saying you do good or you do evil because we could remedy that. We could fix it. We could self-improve. But he doesn't want us to self-improve. He wants another son in there. He doesn't want us. <laughs> so he's, but we won't, we, won't, um, we won't admit that if we're still hoping in ourselves to be the true heir. I mean, do you see what I mean? We, if we're trying to bring forth our own righteousness, we're not gonna, we're not gonna fess up to that. We're gonna, I, I love this. I, I'm, there's good in me, there's virtue in me. But he's saying you, you, you hate the good. You, and he's gonna, he's gonna define what this good and this evil is. Okay. It's, it's maybe slow now, but it's going to build, and each piece is part of the puzzle. So he's, he's catching them at their nature. Pig, you love the mud. Don't go there. Okay, but I want to. I really want to, because I love it. I love it, right? So then he goes on in the rest of the sentence to define this good and this evil that they are drawn to by nature, who pluck off their skin from them and their flesh from off their bones. So it has now moved from the passion of the heart or the force of the inward nature, but that these leaders are plucking off the skin and the flesh, and the flesh from the bones of the people that they're meant to lead. And um, this is the deliberate intent of devouring these are the motives of a beast. They hunger for the flesh of others to satisfy their appetites. These actions are extremely deliberate for one does not pluck off skin and flesh by accident, but rather in a deep pursuit to consume it. Like if you have a piece of chicken, you just don't go, oops, I just devoured that. And, and sit there and like pick every little shred of meat off the bone. You know, someone would say, no, I think this is a little beyond like slip mm -hmm. You know, you like the chicken. <laughs> you ate every finger lick and bit of it. <laughs> the skin and the bone. You know, it's, it's a thing of nature. A beast 
It's going to lick those bones. It loves to devour. So this is contrasted with the lamb who offers his own skin and flesh for the sheep. Rather than feeding upon them for his own lusts, we had the example of, of the true shepherd and head of the body and nature of the body in the last chapter at the end. But these guys are totally other kind. Next verse, verse 3, who also eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them, and they break their bones and chop them in pieces as for the pot and as for flesh within the cauldron. So let's read that again. They eat the flesh of my people. They flay their skin from off them. They break their bones. They chop them in pieces. And as for the pot as, and as flesh within the cauldron. So as if verse 2 were not enough, we now find a continued feeding upon the sheep. The flesh, the skin, even the bones are broken and chopped into pieces for the flesh pots. Now, the flesh pots were something they had in Egypt, something that was part of actually the priesthood in different ways of dealing with the sacrifice, but they put all this in a cauldron and seized some of the meat and such, you know, flesh. But these guys are taking the sacrifice and getting all the meat in their flesh pot cauldrons to devour upon their own lusts. So that which was meant for the Father, that which was meant to be offered up, they're taking in in the spirit of devouring. So God is not seeing their outward ministry, but viewing all their deeds through the eyes of nature. And that's, that's the thing I kept getting was, he's not seeing that they're a leader or a priest or a prince, a, 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 some official with the house of Jacob. He's totally viewing them by nature. And I think sometimes we forget that all our father sees is nature. He doesn't view by deed. He never sees it. I mean, it's kind of sad at the end of days when you've maybe had a great ministry and he's dividing sheep and goats. He doesn't even care. He, 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 there's nothing in his eyes for, for what we do, but what we are. He, he, he sees into nature. This is our God. And so these guys in the story, in the time period of Micah, are probably very much important and busy and etc. But in the eyes of the father, they're just pure beast. Pure beast. This is how Jerusalem looked before Babylon. Can you fathom? We can't. We can't fathom what it looked like to the father. We cannot fathom the abomination <laughs> with the lack of his son. And it's not about getting down on evil. It's about seeing the nature that's not his son so that his son can be enthroned in <laughs> everything, everything. All right, so um, these are not lambs but wolves, beasts that feed on the flesh of others, picking and picking, flying and chopping, dissecting with the heart to devour, not to die for. Okay, so in our story we may say, I would never do that. But listen, do we pick on one another? Do we dissect each other's motives? Do we point out one another's faults, judging and condemning? Do we blame shift so someone else bears the shame? Do we break someone down in the eyes of others, break them down in the eyes of others so our hunger for recognition can be fed? Do we devour the glory at the cost to someone else? What have we conformed to? What nature has transformed our inward approach? If God sees us through nature and not outward things, how do we appear? Does his lamb, his firstborn son in sacrifice manifest? Or is there the nature of the beast? Once again, the time for bringing forth the son has come. It's the time of harvest. And there's a foreign seed, the fruit of the flesh. Remember, if you reap the flesh, you will sow the flesh. God is not mocked. So, and the fruit of the flesh wars against the spirit. And in the book of Revelation, it wars against the lamb and his followers, his bride. <laughs> so, so we don't want to war against the lamb. I mean, it, rarely is it our intent to war against the lamb and devour the sheep. I mean, we're not thinking that. I, I can't believe that we would be. But that's what's going on. Because the flesh, if left to itself because of its nature, 
will do just, it will hunger for glory and it will do it at the cost of someone else. It will pick someone apart to, to drink in something that will boost them. You know, we as followers of the Lamb, we drink his blood. We eat the, sac we eat the sacrifice. We do that. We eat the sacrifice. But vampires eat blood too, drink blood too. I mean, come on, just be real. We drink the blood of the lamb, and vampires drink blood too, it, quote unquote. I'm not. Why do vampires drink blood? Yeah, to suck it out just to get the life, to get something out of someone, leave them dead so they. But Jesus, Jesus, when we drink his blood, we're willing to die so others get life. It's a whole different transfer, it's a whole different. Can you see? It's a whole different spirit. It's a whole different nature. Wolves and lambs. Wolves and lambs. You know, when Randy taught the blog on um, wolves and sheep's clothes, or lambs and wolves, wolves and lambs, I just felt such a powerful hit in the spirit. Like, this is, this is important right now, that we are able to put on sheepskin. I'm not talking to you, or I'm just saying to myself, like, that I am able to put on a sheepskin and let this beast inside run wild. And that the father doesn't care how I look. Just like these guys in Micah chapter 3. He doesn't care how important they seem to everybody. They may have everyone in Jacob and Israel and Samaria and Jews, Judah and Jerusalem fooled. They may all think they're sheep because they have sheepskin on. But the father's looking into their motives. And he's saying, you're, you're ravening wolves. You are, you are chopping up the bones. You're flaying the skin. You're picking the flesh. You're sucking the blood, and I mean, you know what I'm saying, but for you, for you, it, he doesn't see the outward. And, and how does that flow in, in Micah? Well, the things that are the firstborn son in sacrifice, this is where that happens in, in, in us, in these motives. He comes to the Father when he's formed in us in sacrifice, in a spirit of dying for others. Isn't that something? This is how he grows, and this is how he flows, and this is what manifests. This is the fruit of, of his, this son coming out of us. And so, so it's the season of the father receiving his son. We saw it in chapter 1. And what is he getting but wolves and beasts? It's a wrong harvest. It's a completely wrong harvest. And we're going to look at that in Isaiah chapter 5. This harvest has, I, I planted this vineyard, I sowed it, I did everything right, and I've, instead of lambs, I got beasts. What happened to my vineyard? You, you know, that's in the Bible. These are the thoughts of God's heart. But let's continue. So the next verse, chapter four, 3, verse 4 says, Then they shall cry unto the Lord, but, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time as they have behaved themselves ill in their doing. So they're, at this point, these guys are so deceived as to think that God will be moved on their behalf despite all. <laughs> but, but the Lord cannot even look upon this. The father is waiting to behold his son. He's waiting to hear the Abba Father, you know, of his son. And these, these are the howlings of wolves, you know? But, but they think because they have the right name that, that the Lord will, will still honor that. He can't even look at it. You know what I mean? And I'm not saying now, in my own heart, that we're not in Christ and saved and accepted in the beloved and the Lord hears our prayers. I don't, I'm not speaking in that realm. I'm speaking more in the realm of bringing forth the Son, in the realm of bringing forth Christ. Um, and so verse 5 says, Thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err, that bite with their teeth. There's another bestial connotation. And cry, Peace! And he that putteth not into their mouths, they even prepare war against him. <laughs> so it says these prophets that are, are releasing this spirit and biting with their teeth, they have this, this lamb, this uh, beast nature. They're biting with their teeth. They're crying peace, but, but if you don't receive their message that they're pushing on you, they're going to 
war against you. If, do you see the difference? We had the breakthrough in chapter two where we saw this is the true head of, of Israel and of Jerusalem. He dies. He lets the wolf consume him in a spirit of giving himself for his enemies. And this is, this is our breakthrough. This is, this is going to bring forth the sun. This is going to let him come out of us. The spirit is the head. And so he's saying, okay, you saw what the real head looked like at the end of chapter two. You saw it in the good shepherd. You saw how he laid his life down for the sheep, how he let the wolves, you know, he didn't run like a hireling and save his life. He died. Now he's saying, now compare that who is the true head to all these other heads inside of you and how they deal with stuff. Lay that template of the nature of the lamb over all these other motives and intents within you and compare. <laughs> you see what I mean? <laughs> this breakthrough is meant to happen in every inward part, every inward part. He's supposed to be the breakthrough. He's supposed to release the lamb in this area and that area and this area and that every inward part. <laughs> Amen. He's the breakthrough. But if we have a head over this, you know, if, if the Edomites are and the Philistines are here inside of us and these heads are, are beasts, uncircumcised, then he, he, we're, we're not going to release the sun. The, that bringing forth of the sun ain't going to happen. So there, he's not just starting with the problem, he's starting with the answer and saying that he is your head and he's going to lead you out. Amen. He's in you and he's your head. But we have to see where he's going to go to deal with this stuff. So um, let's go to um, Revelation chapter 17. And I'm just going to read a few verses here and then I'm going to read a few notes from when Randy taught on the book of Revelation in 2012. And, um, and there's some notes that I feel would kind of help us on this journey in this chapter. And, um, and why there's such an emphasis right now on the beast that is within us is because these guys at the end of chapter three, or in the middle of chapter three, they're gonna be sent to Babylon. Okay, they're gonna be sent to Babylon. And the book of Revelation helps us understand the spirit of Babylon. And as we see how the book of Revelation defines Babylon, we will understand why they are being sent there. Because it has to do with being a beast. Okay, so it's part of, it's part of the journey. So I'm going to read, these are Randy's notes from his class. And I'm just going to read a few things, just kind of let it wash over you, just to drink in the essence of uh, the spirit of that nature and how, how different it is than the lamb. Notice that the, beasts and the beast and the lambs have horns. They both have power and rights and ability to control, but the lamb's horns are covered with eyes. The horns on the beast are covered with crowns. This displays an open declaration of its rights, privileges, its right to be honored. Here we see the true meaning of blasphemy. The arrogant and ruthless spirit of the beast is a blasphemous display in opposition to God's true spirit. Can you see that in those people in Micah? The beast is a copycat of the lamb, but is not of the same spirit. The beast gets wounded, but he gets healed and causes the whole world to marvel at his great deliverance. It results in a greater glory to himself. In the case of the lamb, he remains slaughtered. We are never to recover from the mortal wounding of the cross. But some come out of it in victory and put it all behind them. The lamb was wounded for its selflessness for others instead it's in, for others in its own death instead of theirs. The people are forced out of fear or loss of being able to buy or sell to honor the beast. The followers of the lamb see his scars, understand the cost, and follow anyway out of love. The love of God constrains us. The lamb has renounced the power available and emptied himself. The beast drinks their blood, but the lamb willingly pours out that blood for others. Let me read that again. That's an important sentence to the study. The lamb has renounced the power available and emptied himself. It's the exact opposite of what they did in, in chapter 3 of Micah. 
The beasts drink the lamb's blood, but the lamb willingly pours out that blood for his enemies. You see the difference? The witness of the lamb is in selfless giving and loss to benefit others. In so doing, the beast is seen for what it is internally. Now the new Jerusalem is the lamb's city. These people are living in Jerusalem beneath here in this prophecy, or in Judea, and different. but Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem in, in, in Revelation, is the Lamb city. David had the presence of God there in the center. He lives in her and he shines out of her. Out of her comes healing to the nations. She is a bride, not a harlot. Babylon is the beast's city. The beast imposes his will on others but the lamb will refuse to use coercion. The beast wants to destroy all opposition, but the, ba the lamb seeks the interest of the oppressor. We love our enemies. <laughs> the way of Christ crucified gives up his own interests instead of using the cross to get his way. There is the forsakenness of the cross, but that must be realized as part of Christ crucified. It's not a means of winning, but to help others win. God's banner of victory is a picture of weakness and acceptance. However, the images of the beast and what pertains to him are covered in regal glory, beauty, and power. Power is the ability to bring others to your way and will, either by swaying them, persuasion by means of coercion, guilt, amiable personality, fear tactics, mental reasoning, flattery, force, domination, intimidation, <laughs> manipulating them, brutality. It, the, this is beast, you're just pushing. Babylon, the nature of the beast. I'm skipping through, I'm just touching on some points because we're not really trying to learn anything right now. We're just trying to taste of a spirit. Babylon, the nature of the beast. The picture we get of Babylon is all grand and positive traits. There is wealth in Babylon, beauty, Deck in a, the Babylonians deck an expensive wardrobe with jewels and gold. Her effect is dazzling. When John was told to look upon Babylon, the harlot, he marveled greatly. This was no small and petty thing to behold. His guide had to correct him. John had to be corrected because he was astonished or wondered or was amazed at the grandeur of Babylon. Let's look at that. Revelation chapter 17. So remember, these guys are fixing to be sent to Babylon in our study of Micah. And I believe we won't really catch the import of that if we don't really see what the spirit of Babylon is defined as in, in the book of Revelation. You know, there's, there's a spiritual significance to Babylon. All right, so let's start in verse 3, Revelation chapter 17 and verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and bedecked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the Great, the Mother of Harless and Abominations of the Earth. And I saw a woman drunk with the blood of the saints. Do you see, hear that sentence? And I saw a woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with a great wonder. Sounds like the people in Micah, doesn't it? And the angel said to me, why are you wondering? I will tell thee the mystery of this woman and of the beast that carries her which has seven heads and ten horns. And the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder. There's that word again, wonder. They that dwell on the earth, they're going to wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is. You know, this is to John, to those who dwell on the earth. It's a one, these things are, are not the way they see God and life in themselves. These are astonishments. They're unknown wonders. I don't want to, 
I don't want to have that in my life. I want, I want this to be what I understand in my innermost core. I don't want to go, what is this spirit of Babylon? And I'm enticed by it. I'm a little bit in admiration of it. And having messengers say to me, she's drunk on the blood of the lambs. She's drunk on the martyrs of Jesus. Her cup is full of a, she rides on a beast in her nature. Everything she has is for profit. She's a, a whore. She gets paid. It's for her. There's no union by nature. There's no love for another. There's nothing here. But the vileness of a, someone who lives for self. messenger had to direct his eyes to the, to the discernment of what's hidden and not the outward because the outward of those types of things always draw and look good from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil but we're seeing the core and the spirit of it so we can go oh this looks bad I would never do that but I would do that That's right. I, I would, you know what I'm saying yes. I would do that I would, I would be impressed too because I need to see the Lord I would too. <laughs> you know what I'm saying I thank you yes I mean, I'm just really putting a point on what you just said you know and it's but, needed it's needed that because it's it's yeah. It's it's you're saying it more clear than I. No, no. To me, to me, that's what I was trying to say, and I'm so glad you said it because it's yeah. It's like even John was going, like what you just said, it, and, and the Lord's like the messenger is saying, you have to discern what this is. Yeah, Lord, because why? Because all these folks that we're reading about in Micah are fixing to go to Babylon, and Babylon was the government of the world. They were. It was amazingly beautiful there. They were powerful and affluent. They had the best, they had the best of the best of everything. I mean, it, you people wanted to be in Babylon. They wanted to stay. The majority loved it. They were seduced and enticed. But hello, that spirit is still in the world. It's still in the church world, in my opinion. And even John. I mean, my gosh, if John's enticed by it, hello. I, I'm on my face before the Lord, man, for me. But, but here's the thing. This is the thing. She's, she's drunk on the blood. It's that picture of them picking off the flesh and this attitude that are my attitudes apart from the lamb in me. I am like that. It's not my brother. It's not my sister. It's not the guys in Micah who have been dead for a thousand years. It's not the people in Revel. It's me. I am not looking at anyone else but me. God is dealing with me right now. That's important. That's important to me. Just kind of gone to, you know, the difference between a beast devouring and partaking of a sacrifice. And, you know, when a beast devours, there is no discernment between the outward and the inward. It's all the same. They're going to take what they think is theirs until it fills them enough, and then they'll just leave the rest behind. But, you know, when you get, like, in Exodus, when he starts, like, lining out, the, you need to start discerning the inward parts. Mm -hmm. And you need to start taking, like, the outward parts. I mean, this is like saying, like, mm -hmm. this is how I, sacrifice. you're not going to devour a lamb. You're going to partake of the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just a totally different nature of one is just, um, 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 and, and the other is this, I'm eating this for a reason. Mm -hmm. I'm not, it's not just because I'm hungry, it's because I need this. We need to partake of this in order for something to be covered, for, for all of us to be covered. So it's just just really seeing the difference between something that just intakes without discernment or cause just because it's hungry and it wants to fill itself versus seeing, like, just discerning the inward parts of like, you know, God's just going through that. It's like, now <laughs> you're not going to devour this like a beast. You're going to take these parts. You're going to eat these parts. Yeah. <laughs> so that's just, wonderful. And that speaks directly to what Paul was talking about. Passover. I mean, uh, talking about uh, the Lord's table. You know, and the, you know, don't you have houses to do all that? Yes. Don't, don't do that. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the same, you know, same 
spirit of that, you know, as, as, as you were reading that, I was thinking the same thing. And it goes right along with some other things the Lord has been sharing with me about our motives for pursuing the Lord, because you know, He just keeps showing me that the, that the Pharisees were, were pursuing Jesus. And all these people were pursuing Jesus, but they were doing it for their own purposes, you know, for, their own, for the wrong motives. It is like I think we should pray even even after we're done. Hold on to these things and Lord, give us discernment. I think that we need to pray that when we have a prayer time after this. Give us discernment and let us discern what is the nature of Your Son and what is something that looks like it but is riding on a beast in its motivations and sustained by the blood of the martyrs. I mean, really, really. Because the people that were sent to Babylon that didn't bring forth the son, when the presence of God was in Jerusalem, David brought it in. I mean, this is Micah now. But conformed to the beast, they didn't know. I mean, when they went into that environment, that was like home. That was like home. And so, I mean, we'll, we'll go more. And let me read a little more in Revelation. Um, I'm going to start at 7 again. I think we need to hear these, you know, it's just good. The Word of God. Word of God. Love the Word of God. And the angel or messenger said unto me, Why do you wonder or marvel is another word for, for wonder. I will tell you the mystery of this woman, of the beast that carries her, that has seven heads and ten horns. Um, yeah, the beast that thou saw was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Here we go. And they that dwell on the earth shall marvel or wonder. And then listen to this next. Whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. The book of the life of the Lamb. I just that hit me so deep. It's like, Lord, I don't care if my name is written in every book in Babylon that talks about Christ crucified. If I am not written into the Lamb's book of life, I don't care what's written about me. Just take me, name, burn it all up. Make everyone think my name is a malefactor. Do it. I, erase me from this planet. Erase me and shame me. But put me in the Lamb's book of life. Please let me be written there. Please let me be. I don't care if I'm written anywhere else. You know, make the website crash, burn up all the books, and make me a shame in the eyes of every generation here to come, but let me be written in the Lamb's book of life. Please, please do not let that spirit entice me. And that I would marvel and not understand and dwell on the earth so deeply that I would find my life here that I wouldn't be written into his, into his being. I mean, that just hit me today real strong. And that's another prayer. Scary prayer, but I'm praying it now, man. I better pray it now than later. And, um, you know, verse 14, just a few little steps down from this, we've got war with the lamb. These shall make war with the lamb. Isn't that what happened in Micah? With the prophets who don't listen, we're going to make war against you. These shall make war with the lamb. They give their power and their strength to the beast. It says that in verse 13. Verse 14, they'll make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. Why? It's that breakthrough guy, because he's the Lord of lords. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. That means they're going to lay their lives down, man. Chosen for the altar. And he said unto me, the waters which thou seest where the harlot sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Final verse, verse 18. And the woman whom thou saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. She reigns over the kings of the earth. Anything in me that is still connected to the old man that hasn't really let the cross pierce and divide and move. This spirit is king over it. That terrifies me. I mean, and it's not about being terrified, but there is a place to just look at it and get a little bit awakened and shaken. I mean, that, and yet, 
in chapter, is it 11? Yes, 11, when those two martyrs finally let themselves be given in the spirit of, of selfless giving, the breakthrough happened. What is it that the heaven, the temple in heaven breaks open and the, a loud declaration starts crying out, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. When did that declaration come in the book of Revelation? When they laid their lives down unto the death. That spirit. They became the sacrifice instead of devoured it. Isn't it beautiful? It's be and what is the book of Revelation? It's the unveiling of Jesus Christ in his body, in his bride. That's the man child. Chapter 12 says she's travail. This is a woman clothed with the stars and the moon. And she's bringing forth the sun together. This is the book of manifesting the firstborn son, manifesting him in his nature, sacrifice. And she's thrown into wolves to see if she's a wolf or a sheep. Hallelujah. And the test will come the same way it came to the shepherd. He'll lead her in by his nature inside of her. Let's give ourselves to death. And let's do it in a spirit of love for our enemies. We are not that nature. It's got to be the sun in us. And that's the thing. When we're threshed by the spirit, dividing our motives and intents, he's trying to separate us from ourselves unto the sun. <laughs> he's not asking us to repair ourselves. You know, in, in, in the ark, remember when Randy taught on Noah's ark, the spiritual realities of Noah, and it was even during the conference he took two sessions to develop this teaching. He said, in the ark there's all these beasts. You know, and it's, there's a time period to, to <laughs> let the cross deal with the beasts that are you so that the sun can come out of that thing into the new. It, you know, it, it, that's not the time to deny that, 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 that those motives are there. That's the time to own them and take them to the cross and travail to bring forth the Son who will be the spirit of the Lamb, who is that spirit. And I know it's, I don't want it to be teaching, though. I don't want to understand that. I want it to work in my motives, <laughs> you know. I don't, it's all I really care about. I don't care if I understand this. I care if it comes out of, he comes out of me instead. So let's just read a few more of these notes in Revelation, and we'll, we'll look down at this verses coming here. And, um, I think we read this, but let's just read it. Their appearance, this is Babylon, this appearance is seductive. We just read it in Revelation chapter 17. This is Babylon the Great. Her appearance is seductive. It's, her way is deceitful. Notice the foul nature of her relationships and who it is that engages in these relationships. Only the great men of the earth, the elite such as kings and princes and men of means and merchants. Notice also that these noble, wise, strong people make war, not with Christians in general, but with the lamb and the lamb's followers, specific. Mm -hmm. Bullying the weak and the defensive. Um, the power of the beast is found in its wisdom and its nature. It is Babylon. And just like the Babylonians tore down the temple, they want to tear down the marriage in the temple, with the church with the lamb. They want to tear down the temple. They want to break that down. Um, but we overcome by the lamb coming out of us, even in that attack. <laughs> Amen. He's coming to break this down. And the spirit of Christ that is in us says, no, I'm going to overcome by the blood of the lamb, the word of my testimony, and I love not my life even unto the death. It's glorious. It's a glorious thing. It's a glorious thing. But you know, you kind of got to be all in. <laughs> you just, it is not like I'm just hang, hanging out here with the message of Christ and, you know, hey, just another day. <laughs> it's like I, I got war raging in me against the lamb. I got beasts rising, and I got a Holy Spirit blowing like the mighty wind from the four corners of the earth trying to bring forth the sun. Glory to God. Today is just not another day. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, if you are in it to bring forth the sun, let me tell you, today is not just another day. You know, you are wrestling you are crying out, you are travailing, you're threshing, and you're pushing, <laughs> pushing that baby out, amen. <laughs> you and egg, egg to pieces, it's all happening. It isn't teaching at that point. 
You know, and if you're sleeping while everyone else is travailing, I mean, maybe tonight you need to ask the Lord to wake you up a little bit because God knows you don't want to miss that, right? You don't want to miss it. Don't sleep through the birthing. <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. They, it says it in Hosea. They missed their time. Chapter 10, right? And they brought forth wind. They missed the time. Ephraim, you are an unwise son. Ephraim, you're an unwise son, and you missed the time of your birthing. That's Hosea. I don't want to be an unwise son. Hallelujah. Let's continue in Micah. Are you guys enjoying the scriptures? It's kind of a cool journey, isn't it? It's already eight. Does it feel like already eight? Oh, my God. Should we take a break or keep going? I don't know. Tell me what you want. I don't care. Keep going? Let's do it. I feel like we just started. Oh, it's weird. Okay. Let's go. All right. So, um, all right. So now we're on verse in Micah. We ended, I'm sorry, my notes. What verse are we on, lads? Say five. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know. Someone read five to me here. I don't know. See, see. So then verse 6, therefore night shall be unto you. You shall not have a vision, it shall be dark to you. You shall not divine, the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark. Their seers seven, their seers will be ashamed, their dividers confounded. They'll cover their lips, there's no answer from God. You know, I, I always thought about that like some wicked prophet in the Old Testament, this vile guy. Or, and the Lord's like, no, Kelly, that's you. <laughs> Hello. When, when you just want to justify all that beast you just devour someone next to you you know what i'm talking about picking on each other picking on their flesh we don't think that's it that's total beast picking on each other's flesh that's picking on the flesh going after each other you know and, and i saw so a lord it's just whatever that is it's just i need you now i want some intimacy show me your heart give me some light come on i want to see the lamb i want to know you intimately He's like, I gotta, you got to have no light. You're not going to divine anything. It's, it's really cool. <laughs> like, because I was like reading that verse and I was just sort of thinking of it as, you know, punishment. Yeah, sort of. Yeah. I was thinking about it like that, but then we went to Revelations and where we read what we read. And now coming back to this, it's, it's, less, it's less punishment, more like, you guys can't discern with your eyes, so I'm going to take that from you because you're not, it doesn't have the power. Yes. The, your eyes are deceiving you. I'm helping you. I'm going to take away yes. that thing that's caught, that's lying to that's you. Right. It's lying to you, lying to your, your brain or your heart or so whatever. I'm taking that from you. So you're going to have to discern through different means. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, you're going to have to discover me through different means. You're yeah, have through lamb's eyes. Yeah. Through lamb's eyes. Not crowns of glory and the things that Babylon holds. You know, this, all that, they had heads, but one... One had lamb's eyes on it, other crowns and accolades. And, and I mean, there's pride when we do that. Well, they were wrong. Well, I can't get over it until, uh, there's no, I want to die for my enemies. I'll take the blame. I'll be ashamed. Punch, turn my cheek. Hit me again. Get it. I mean, that's the lamb in us. It's got to be the lamb. But there's no, um, I want to bring you forth. I just want things from you. Share something deep in the word. Open my eyes to wonderful things in your but there's not like, open my lamb's eyes to uh, release the son in sacrifice because I see the altars of his nature and I want to lay him upon them and I just want you, Lord. It's like, light shineth, you know. I mean, the heart is turned towards the Lord and the veil is rent. But your heart's not towards the Lord when you're biting, devouring, picking, accusing, blame, you know, these beast things. And then you're like, Lord, show thy beloved son to thy beast. You know, take thy pearl and open it to all these things. I know that's what you long to do, Lord. And why don't I see anything? And why are the heavens brass? And why is God silent? You know, maybe it's a sign. Maybe it's not. I don't know. I don't know. But I ask myself, Lord, maybe it's because I'm just justifying all this stuff instead of breaking before you. I can't change it. It's me. 
but I don't have to justify it. I don't have to blame them. I don't have to pick on. I can cry out and say, I'm a beast before you, just like Saul did. You know what I'm saying? Make me blind and then make me see only the lamb. Give me lamb's eyes. Man, Lord, just convert my being. Let me lay in darkness for three days until I'm done with this slaughter-breathing mess. I can't change me, but I don't have to feed it. I don't have to declare it in your presence. I don't have to stuff it in your face. I can say I hate it and I want your son instead. I can do that. I can do that. A broken and a contrite spirit, oh Lord, thou wilt not despise. Possess my inward parts. Purge me with hyssop and lowliness, Lord. I was born in iniquity. In my mother's womb, I was conceived in this nature, but you put your son in me. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Bring forth the son, and I will offer him as whole burnt offerings, and I will lead others into this nature. This is Psalm 51. David couldn't change who he was, but he knew how to speak to the Father. He knew how to approach him. And I think sometimes, you know, if that beast thing gets too much leverage in me, you know, I'm making so many excuses, I'm wondering why he's quiet. You know, I can't change me, but I can, I, can, I can stand against me and be on the Father's side. I can be on the Father's side. I can be totally my worst enemy and say this, I will not side with the beast. I may be the beast, but my heart will not stand with that. I don't have to unite with it. I unite with the lamb against all that rages in me. You know, there's this old thing that, that I, Randy shared early in Bible school, and it carried me through the darkest hours of my life. I said it every day like a mantra about a good spiritual, in Ireland, my first trip. Rage, rage, the dying of the light. Rage, rage. You know, there, if you love the Lord, rage against that junk. Don't just let it rage on everybody else or rage on you and eat your lunch and destroy your life and take over your mind and run your emotions. You've raged the dying of the light. I am not going to let the lamb die in me. I am not going to let the devil do that. I am not going to let the lamb be devoured by these, by the enemy warring against me, by the things in me warring against him. I am raging against this. There's a place to battle. There is. David, is it, David said, is there not a cause? Isn't this to bring forth the sun? We want to bring forth the sun here. We're, we don't even know where I'm trying to teach him. We're trying to bring him forth. Is there not a cause? You know, and just like, I, no, there is. You know, the, the scriptures scream it out. They scream it out. And it's not that other people make it a book of numerology or end time events. It's that I make it something less than what's going on in me so that I will not be written in the Lamb's Book of Life in the ways I want to be to bring him forth because I just marvel or I watch or I take a view of the scriptures where I'm not in there. It's not my story. I'm not walking through that. I am not the one God's speaking to. Somebody else. It's this distant thing. I was like, how are you ever going to be reached? How are you ever going to be reached? You're far, far away. Darkness, darkness. But here's what happens to Micah, who is not in that place. Verse 8, Micah says this. But truly, I am full of power by the spirit of the Lord. I am full of his judgment and of his might. And I am full of the spirit to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. He isn't apologizing. He's not putting on a fake sense of lowliness. The guy is so full of the spirit of the living God to declare these eternal things. He's just like, I am not asleep. I'm not dull of hearing. I am not out of tune. I am not in darkness. I am full of the spirit of the Lord. How did he, Micah get that way? Certainly not by being better than anybody else because he's not. Nobody is. He got that way because he obviously didn't deceive him. He just, I want the Lord. We can be with Micah. We can say, I want to be full of the power of the spirit of the Lord and of judgment against these things in me against these things in me. What does chapter 3, verse 1 say to the leaders and the princes? Is it not for you to know judgment? But I have the spirit of the Lord and of his judgment, Micah said. Hey, it is for me to know judgment. I am supposed to know discernment. And I am full, that's what Micah says, I'm speaking as Micah, and I am full of the spirit of the judgment and discernment of the living God to declare unto Jacob his transgressions. I'm seeing through the eyes of the lamb what's going on, and I'm full of the spirit. That can be us. That should be us. 
that needs to be us so we can do the business that we need to do so we don't go sent to Babylon and marvel and conform to the world instead of being transformed by the renewing of our mind into the image of the Lamb, becoming a living sacrifice. Hebrews chapter something, 12, I don't know what. But yeah, we should be in that spirit. That's why this stuff was written. It wasn't written to teach us. It wasn't written for scholars to analyze. It was written for people to birth the sun. And they had to get in the place Micah's at for it to happen. And they had to leave just looking at the good shepherd, but having all these heads in them that usurp the, the beasts. And then from sleeping like a prophet to those, he said, listen, we're like the heads that are beasts and reigning inside of us. But we're also like the prophets justifying them. Both have to be dealt with. The priests and the prophets, the princes and the declarers of truth. That prophet in us needs to stand up and say, I am full of the spirit of the Lord and of judgment. You're coming down, Jacob. Yeah. Your transgression is fully aware by the spirit of the Lord to whom me I divide you out. That has to happen to our prophets. We have to have the, div you know, there are just people walking. In us, we should have the diviner, the, the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Something in us should testify. That's not Jesus. That's not Jesus. That's not Jesus. That's not the lamb. I, that, that, it, we should just be filled. I mean, we should pray that tonight. Let's fill us with the spirit of discernment, of judgment. I mean, that keeps coming, doesn't it? In, 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 that We need that. That's our step. Uh, to be full of the spirit, to be full of light, which dispels right. all darkness. Yes. And that's why he came. And, you know, when Jesus first began to preach, he said, uh, people who sat in darkness saw a great light. And, and that's the spirit's job. You know, right. that's why it says, it talks about, you know, judgment and everything, and it talks about the spirit, because there is no darkness in him, so he's going to expose that's right. every single Amen. thing. If, if, you know, and it's ours to submit to that exposure. So, then, no darkness. He's going to be there, and we'll be full. Well, he's, he's a little bit I'm full, like you said, full of the spirit. I hope we got that. It was really good. Thank you, Lord. And then so the next verse, verse 9. Hear this, I pray you. Listen to the words. Now the words make a little more sense. Hear this, I pray you, you heads of the house of Jacob, you princes of the house. Who's the house? We are. Hear this, I pray you, O heads of the house, princes of the house, who abhor judgment and pervert all iniquity. Hear what? Hear that you can be full of the spirit of the Lord and of his judgment. Hear that if you're not, you're not going to have any vision to go forward based on your own covering of the beast. Verse 10, but they build up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. So literally, we saw those heaps that needed to be treaded down in Samaria and Jerusalem in chapter 1. These things were built up with the blood of the saints. Huh? It's the harlot. That's right. That's right. You look at Hosea and you think, what's, that, what's the deal with all this harlotry and addressing this? Why does the Spirit say this in the, in, in the Old Testament? Well, it says it here in Micah that they built up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. This was meant to be his bride, his habitation. Built on sacrifice of others instead of being the sacrifice. Zion is being built upon the blood of the martyrs and not through their blood as dying seeds to bring forth the son in sacrifice. And then it just, it, you know, we're getting close so we can pray, but the next verse says, verse 11, the heads there of judge for reward, the priests teach for hire, the prophets divine for money. <laughs> you know, it's saying everything they do is for their own increase. Nothing is the dying seed principle. Nothing is that life would come out of death or that the sun would be released in sacrifice, that altars would fuel Jerusalem. The altar of the burnt offering, the sun ever ascending, day and night, thousands of, you know, on every level, a constant, massive release of the firstborn son up to the Father. The Zion is built on sacrifice. It lives by sacrifice. The son is ever ascending in sacrifice to his Father. Glory to God. Oh my God. Can you even fathom the reality of that in us? It's beyond, it's beyond, we cry out to know him, we cry out to be this. But this Zion that's going into Babylon is built on the blood of the saints instead of the release of the firstborn in sacrifice. Now you see why it must be threshed and plowed under. 
Verse 11 says, yet they will lean upon the Lord and say, is not the Lord among us? No evil can come upon us. I'm a little speechless there. <laughs> I don't know what to say. While violating his nature, they declare him as their source and protection, even as they crucify him and his people while doing God's service in their minds. Therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field. Therefore, chapter verse 12. Chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field. Jerusalem will become heaps in the mountains of the house as the high places of the forest. So, you know, now the Lord has built his case for why they're going into to, to captivity. And, of course, he's going into death back in Jerusalem, and they're going into captivity to bring forth a son. I mean, it, it's not punishment. It's, it's still chastisement. He's bearing their... Uh, the penalty or chastisement for their pieces upon me. He's bearing this in death that they might bring forth a son still. So it's, it's still him trying to bring forth Christ. It's the mercy of the Lord to send them to Babylon. He's just having to manifest why it's not my son. The, oh, and then you might, and then someone might go, well, what do you mean it's not your son? Well, it wasn't my son in nature. Well, what do you mean it wasn't your son in nature? Well, okay, let's talk then. You flay the sacrifice, you pick the bones. You, what does that mean in your story? The way you treat one another. That's not Zion. It's built with blood. It's not built with the sacrifice of the sweet nature of the lamb. This is, this is my home. And I want you to get him, so I'm going to be merciful to you and not let you continue in this way, ignorantly, right? But something's going to happen to wake and shake and give you an opportunity to cry out and thresh and bring them forth. That's called mercy. That's not called punishment. That's called love in kindness. <laughs> That's called a good dad, a great dad, a good husband, a wonderful spirit. I want to say, God, you are too, 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 too good. <laughs> Why? Because look at my motives right here. And look at his way to bring me in willing to die and die and die so I can still bring forth his son. That's love, see? That's love. Unless you're just so caught up in yourself and condemnation and compassionate ministry to your soul. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to say. So um, we're going to end before we pray here with, oh, oh, let me go to 14. We'll, let's go into chapter. Um, so 14. Therefore hath hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoices shall descend into it. So again, this was the wrong spirit of the wrong father. This isn't the seed of the father. This is the seed of the enemy, if you will, the beast. 15, and the mean man shall be brought down and the mighty man shall be humbled and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. Verse 16, but the Lord of hosts shall be exalted. Woo! In judgment. And God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. Verse 17, then shall the lambs feed after their manner. Woo! And the waste places of the fat ones shall strangers eat. Hallelujah. So he's saying all this stuff is going to be dealt with and put away, crucified and buried. I'm at the end of Micah, chapter 3, verses 14, 15, 16. Oh, no, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. I'm in Isaiah, chapter 5. Oh, Lord Jesus, have mercy on my soul. I'm leaving these people, and they're, they're wondering what the heck. This is the end of my, uh, Isaiah chapter 5, and I'm, I'm messing it all up because I'm a mess myself, so forgive me. Let's start at verse 5 and just read through, and then all the things I just shared. 
might make sense a little more. <laughs> Doesn't she have to deal with me? And I'm sorry for that. <laughs> I truly am. I really am. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> now will I sing to my well beloved a song? <laughs> You're like, this is great stuff. Where is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> You're making it up. You're making it up. <laughs> Verse 5. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved. Who is the beloved, right? It's the son of his love. Touching his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. He fenced it and gathered out the stones. Look at this care. He planted it with the choices divine. Built a tower in the midst of it. Also made a wine press there and he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And those grapes were wild. <laughs> and now, O oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem, O oh, men of Judah, judge. There is that word. I pray thee, judge between me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done to it? Remember, he's, he, he's, this is all right before captivity. What, what more could be done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, it, it brought forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge. It will be eaten up. I'll break down the wall thereof. It will be trodden down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor dug. There shall come upon it briars and thorns. I will command the clouds that they do not rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah his pleasant plant. He looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry very reminiscent of Micah. Woe unto them that join house to house and field to field, till there be no place that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. In mine ears said the Lord of hosts of the truth, many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair houses, without an inhabitant in them. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, the seed of an homer shall yield an ephah. Woe to them that rise early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink and continue until night, till wine inflame them, and the harp and the viol and the tabret and pipe and wine are in their feasts. But they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity, because they have no knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude are dried up with thirst, Therefore, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory, their multitude, their pomp. He that rejoices shall descend into it, and the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted, and the God that is holy shall be sanctified, and then shall the lambs feed. That's the result of going into captivity, dealing with all this stuff. Then shall the lambs feed after their manner. Then, then. So here it is. The Lord's like, I just want to bring forth my lamb out of this vineyard. I just want my son in sacrifice. And I've done everything I know to do to the men of Judah, to the men of Jerusalem. I've done everything I can. It's not working. So I'm going to take the hedge down. I'm going to not let the rain come. I'm going to deal with that stuff. I'm going to send them into captivity. But there, the lamb will come forth and feed after. The, isn't it beautiful? It's, you see the Lord's heart in it. You don't see his judgment in it. I don't see his judgment in it. I see his heart in it. It's like he's so passionate, he'll wait for the prodigal. But that doesn't mean it's not heartbreaking on certain fronts. That, but at the same point, isn't that awakening and heartbreaking awakening part of getting the land plowed i called my dad today and, and this will be one of the last bits before we pray i called my dad today and i said dad what do they do i guess that's because of the final verses of this chapter of micah which i have now forgotten what they are but i, I read the last verses of micah chapter three and it says um yeah verse 12 it's our last verse Therefore shall Zion, for your sake, be plowed as a field. Jerusalem will become heaps, and the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. Therefore, Zion is going to be plowed under by Babylon. By Babylon. Specifically Babylon. And I said, Dad, because my dad's a farmer. He's been a farmer since his whole life. And I said, what do you do? And 
with a field that brought forth a really bad harvest. You know, what do you do with that field? And I just said, well, you do what you do with every field after any harvest. You just plow it up and get it ready for a new seed. And I'm like, that, you know what? And what did Jeremiah cry to them right before they were going to go to Babylon? To these folks. Break up your fallow ground. Break it up, break it up. What's he saying? He's saying, you didn't bring forth the right seed, folks. You didn't. So you know what? We need to break up this. We need to plow it under. We need to, we need to do it. Babylon doesn't need to do it. We need to, let's do it before Babel. See, that's chapter 4 of Jeremiah. Jer uh, they go into captivity in chapter 29 of Jeremiah. So 25 chapters he's, before they come, he's saying, you plow up your fallow ground. Because in 25 chapters, Babylon's going to do it for you. Now you pick. You want Babylon to do it? Or you? But this, isn't that great? But we should have a Jeremiah inside of us crying to us. That prophet inside of us should be saying, plow up your fallow ground. You know what? We don't have the right seed. What can we do? We can plow it up. We can get our heart broken so that what? The right sun can start having place in us and start forming in us so the right fruit will come forth in our attitudes and nature. Amen. And that's, that's it. Isn't that a great chapter? It's, it's just, I love it. Jesus about the father lending, lending, like renting out his vineyard to the, to the keepers. And in that parable, it's like literally him sowing his son into that vineyard, expecting an increase. But he was usurped and killed. And he was like nowhere to be found. So it's like, a, so you know, you always, I always just read that picture of, you know, these guys abuse the land and all that. But you know, it, it, it were murderers, and you know they were just bad people. But the real, the real problem, like after they killed his servants and abused his servants, he wasn't, he didn't trip out over that. It wasn't until you know he he sowed the son, <coughs> the his beloved son, and didn't get that in return. That's that was the pivotal point in that parable. Was like he well, sowed his son into the vineyard. But he did not. He got well, what's cool is that they said at the end of that parable, they said, well, what are you going to do to these wicked guys? You know, we should da 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 And he goes, know you not? Randy just shared this a while back. Know you not that the stone that the builders rejected hath become the cornerstone? And this is marvelous in our eyes. So he's looking at him going, I get to go into death because of being rejected as the heir. And to the father and to me, for me to go into sacrifice for those who have rejected me is marvelous. I'm not mad at them. I am me at them. <laughs> I love being the lamb. This is marvelous. Great. Thank you for bringing up that beautiful parable because he's not mad. He's marvelous. He's not punishing. He's showing mercy. But we have to plow and we have to discern. And if we don't do our part, you know, we could look at Babylon and be enticed. We won't have the spirit of judgment to thresh these things like we need to, all for one purpose, so that the seed can get good ground in us, like Mary. <laughs> we can just be good ground. Robert. Uh, the, a word is standing out to me tonight, and it is judgment. Mm -hmm. but, but like you said, you, you were just seeing as love and not as judgment. But yet judgment is, has, to, has, has to. to happen. You know, and that's what he's been saying. With a, within all these verses in Isaiah and Revelation and here in Micah that, you know, I mean, Christ bears that judgment, but still has to be born, yeah. you know, and, and so Christ in us That's right. will bear yeah. that judgment, you know. That's right. Now, what's that scripture, mercy and truth have met together, righteousness? Just because it doesn't think it's Psalm 85. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. You see that in Jesus. Those things can be one because of his lamb nature. Well, guys, I don't know why. I, who bears witness that we need to do some praying? I, I pr okay, so all of us. So uh, I don't know. Who's on Skype, Scott? Um, Michelle and Lori and Amy. And Amy, okay. 
Well, I, I don't know. I, I think maybe, um, you, you know, I can just hold the mic and you can, they can be part, but I think we should gather together and pray. And yeah, I think so. I don't want to be up here. I think we need to move together. Maybe you guys can position things where they're able to, to see, but you guys are able to come and also partake because once again, we're not in class mode as much as we are in bringing forth the sun mode and tonight threshing mode, so. get prayer. But I think what we will do is have a group prayer that's specific. We'll close on site and then we'll do individual prayers one for another because that's more private. Yeah, let's do that group prayer now. And then we'll do, yeah, I think that feels right. Sorry, I'm a little slow sometimes. So we're going to end in this prayer. Y'all will include y'all online and on, on Skype and then we'll do individual prayers. And if you guys want to be prayed for individually, just, um, just leave, leave me a note or a text or something, and we'll pray at another point, and we'll be praying for us, praying for you. Lord, we just thank you for um, mercy, mercy and love and the wonder and marvelous essence of your inward being and way that is beyond the heavens, beyond the knowledge of man, beyond the veil of our eyes, the gloriousness of your being and how you deal with things, your ways, Lord. Oh, that Jerusalem would be so threshed and filled with the sun that the nations would come to learn of your ways as is spoken of in Micah. Oh, that that would come in reality, Lord, in us. Father, we know there is a path, there is a progression, there is a process and birth in your son. And we see it in the scriptures, Lord. We don't go anywhere else, but the word you have given us, your word, to be our authority and our guide. And so we long for the things of your word now to have place in us, real place, even as Micah stood up with the spirit of God in discernment and judgment, even as these other prophets did not have it, even as the good shepherd released in his sheep the right sacrificial, his spirit of sacrifice, and even as those other heads refused to, but rather fed on the lamb. Lord, all these things aren't speaking of stories in the Old Testament, but our story right now, how we need you so desperately inside of our own, not our brother or our sister, but us, each one, us. And so, Father, we just want to do business with you. We want to open our heart to you. We want to be available to the Holy Spirit. We want to cry out in the night and rage against the darkness and travail and press in and press him out and stand with you against ourselves, Lord, and it's so much more beyond our prayers right now, but your spirit knows. And we want to bring forth your son, so we're with you. We just tell you that now. And we also say, have your way, not just in us, but in every person who's crying out in the spirit. Have your way. Have your way for your sake, Lord, for your desire, for your needs. We pray it in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll just take a minute to use the bathroom, shut down the equipment. So let's take a